for joining us. We want to thank the Mill stores for hosting us and being able to be our resource to be able to reach you all and help you out. And I think Karen from the Mill wants to just kind of have a little introduction, uh, tell you a little bit about tonight and what we have planned. But Karen, it's all yours. Okay, well, on behalf of the mill and our seven locations, uh, we welcome all of you. Um, I think uh, you're in for a real treat tonight with tonight's program, uh, the first of three in our virtual chicken chat series. Uh, tonight is more of the beginner session, um, and we'll get into that in just a few minutes. But we certainly, uh, again, welcome all of you. We want to make sure we thank the folks at Neutrina. Um, we work very closely with them. Um, Twain, our, our speaker tonight, is a wealth of knowledge and very entertaining as well, uh, and we always enjoy um, our contact with and, and what we do with Neutrina. Uh, so we, we appreciate uh, them working with us. Um, I think we'll hold off until the very end for a few other comments and um, updates. Um, but uh, so for now, that's all I had. Just kind of welcome you and um, we'll go ahead and get into the program from here. Alrighty. Um, so I want to thank everybody. Did you want to do your house finish your housekeeping, Nathan? Yep. So again, here's your your chat, your video, your microphone mute. Uh, please, any questions, pop it in the chat. Unmute yourself. Go for it. Um, you can go to the next slide, Suzanne. And as far as so, we will be trying to do some engagement with you all. Um, you can use your phone or tablet or even a computer on a web browser if you go to Menti. Dot com. So you just follow directions on here. You go to menti.com. We're going to have some kind of fun trivia questions along the way where we'll actually give out some prizes as well. So I'd encourage you to join in um, and then we'll you know, be asking questions about, say, how many chickens you have or just various little trivia questions to help you know, us engage with you all. And again, we will be offering some prizes at the end where it will be directly related to your menti answer. So uh, please, if you go to menti.com, put in the code 6091110, and then you'll be able to put your name in, and then we'll be able to get the prizes out to you. I'll put that in the chat. So here's your prizes. I think that was the menti code. Um, but yep, I think we can go ahead and get started. So first Menti question, how long have you had chickens? So again, go to menti.com, put in the code 6091110 and just type in how many chickens you had or how long you've had them. Sorry. So get a couple answers come in. Good. It looks like a couple of you just got in here recently. I know there was a big boom last year. A lot of people started getting chickens, and I know there was a big influx of them. It looks like you guys might be back for more this year, too. <laughs> oh, good. So a few of you less than a year, and the rest of you more than five years. So we got a good little mixed bag here, Twain. Good deal. Good deal. And there's no such thing as a dumb question. Don't be afraid to ask. I, I'm not judgy at all. Uh, I just saw something the other day and I thought it was very profound. It said no matter who the expert is at whatever subject, they were a beginner at one time, too. So we all had to start somewhere. I think you go ahead to the next slide. Yeah, sometimes we get a lag time. We can go to the next slide, Suzanne. <laughs> I think we're having a little power situation but Twain uh tell us a little bit about your experience with chickens and kind of where you kind of okay. started and where you're at now uh I've been raising chickens for the better part of 50 years um I do not have any alphabet behind my name I am not a PhD or a doctor of veterinary medicine 
Um, my experience is all practical. I also owned and operated a uh, farm store, kind of like the mill, if that was like 10 times smaller. Uh, and we specialized in poultry. So we were getting people started with chickens for decades before uh, the whole backyard chicken craze started up. So uh, I'm not saying I am like the, the biggest expert on chickens, but I have seen a lot, uh, not just chickens, but waterfowl, uh, guineas, uh, pretty much anything with feathers. I've raised it at one time or another. Uh, and so, you know, if I don't know the answer, I'll be flat honest with you and I'll try to get you the answer. Uh, but I have seen quite a bit. So. So wait, sorry, you might have said it earlier. How many chickens do you have now? I think we have 38 right now. I think, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, it's one of those, if you know how many you have, you don't have enough. Uh, my wife does a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. So I, I'm pretty sure we have 38. I think we have 37 hens and one rooster. Uh, he's pretty happy camper. <laughs> so tell me, why not have more roosters than that? Because I think what you told me, it was like 18 to 1 or 12 yeah, to 18 to 1. 12 to 18 to 1 is your ideal ratio because you really don't need a rooster. You don't need a rooster to get eggs. Uh, he is actually uh, my seminar rooster. He goes with me when we were still doing live events. He would travel with me and uh, he would be at the event live and he's trained and he was a little frizzle rooster. He was a show rooster that didn't make the grade. And I don't know how much you know about them, but when a show chicken doesn't doesn't make the grade, their options get real limited really fast. So it was either come to work for me or probably go into the stew pot. So here he is. Uh, he's a frizzle coaching. Um, and uh, he does a good job. So, all right, are we back? I think we might be. Okay. You might um there we go. There we go. There you go. Yeah, what's your interest in raising meat birds? Where, where are we at? So again, menti.com, put in that code uh, 6091110. And just whether you have any interest in raising meat birds, if you have before, just kind of, because it gives us kind of an idea of what maybe we want to talk about a little bit too. Very much so. And by the way, if I do talk about them, it, there'll be absolutely nothing graphic. Uh, I always assume that there's kids on this, so everything will be G rated. There'll be nothing graphic, you know, no pictures of processing birds or anything like that. Just talking about how to raise them. And now ducks. Are you interested in raising ducks? I know, I think Rebecca said she has one now. There's been some some interest in ducks. They are kind of fun, but oh, yeah. sometimes they can be a little complicated with your chickens too. Yes. <laughs> I like to say that ducks have a lot of personality and not all of it's good, but uh, they are a lot of fun and they're very, very interesting. Okay, so my goal here tonight, folks, is not to make you an expert. That's not going to happen in the next 45 minutes, uh, but maybe keep you from making the same mistakes that I've made over the many years uh, and try and get you started off on the right foot so that you uh, enjoy this hobby and you stay in it for a long time. So obviously uh, you have an equipment checklist, things you're going to start with. I am not a big fan of just reading slides to you. so. I assume everybody can read. I'm just going to talk about them. Um, you want to get your chicks, and I know it's, it sounds very uh, kind of lame. Oh, you want a healthy chick. Well, all right. When you're picking out your chicks, you want to pick out nice, lively ones. The same way you pick out tropical fish, if you've ever done that. You don't want one that's often, the, you know, the Charlie Brown Christmas th thing, you know, where it's off by itself and doesn't look too good. I mean, if, if you want to take that check home, that's fine, but just know that maybe it doesn't feel too good. It may not be 100%. So try to pick nice, health, healthy, lively looking checks. You're going to need something to put them in. That's your brooder. Don't worry about the brooder guard. That's, uh, that's more for turkeys and game birds, not so much for chickens. It's a metal thing that fits around your heat lamp so that they don't lean against it. Chickens are pretty smart, so are ducklings. Uh, they don't tend to lean against the heat lamp. Um, so you don't really need to worry about that, but you're going to need a heat lamp, something to keep the chicks in. That's very important. 
you need to kind of simulate the mother hen if you want to think of it that way. So a, a stock tank is ideal, uh, an old wash tub, a plastic tote. Hey, I've brooded thousands of chicks over the years in cardboard boxes, okay? Just be mindful that having wood shavings in the bottom of that box and a heat lamp, you need to have that heat lamp secured for the fire hazard aspect. So I'm not trying to scare you. I've never burned down the house, never even came close. Just make sure it's secured. I do like to put newspaper on the bottom, put the shavings on top. That way you can just roll it up, kind of like a big nasty burrito, and it makes it real easy. Um, depends on who you talk to, uh, whether you should brood them in the house or not. They have to be indoors. I like to brood them in the house. I think most people do. I know the CDC is not real crazy about that, primarily because of the salmonella risk. Now, I'm not going to scare you too bad on that. Um, it's a very small percentage of chickens that carry it. But you don't want to play with this, guys. And I'm going to, you know, look right at the camera and tell you, please don't kiss your chickens. That is not a conspiracy theory from the egg industry. They really don't care if you have chickens or not. They don't want you kissing your chickens either because it gives the whole industry a black eye. You can get salmonella and other nasty things from kissing your chickens, including baby chicks. So, yes, we love our chickens. They have names. They die of old age, but we don't kiss them. Wash your hands. You know, use basic common sense hand sanitizer if you can't wash your hands. Uh, but please don't kiss your chickens. I've heard people say they think it's a conspiracy theory. It is not. Uh, all right. So that being said, uh, whether you do them in the house or not, it's up to you. If you do them in the garage, a couple of tricks. Uh, you know, if your heat lamp burns out in the garage, those chicks will try to tell you, but they won't be able to hear. You won't be able to hear them. So. They may freeze on you. So having two heat lamps out there instead of one, put them both on the same end so they can get away from it if it gets too hot. But if one of the bulbs burns out, you've got another lamp. Here's another old trick that we've done for years. Get a baby monitor. You may have one laying around the house. Put that out there and then you can hear them. You'll hear them. If that light goes out, they'll start crying and going crazy and, and you can go out and uh, take care of them. Like I said, I think most people brood them in the house. That's up to you. If you have someone in the household with asthma or respiratory issues, may not be a good idea. They do produce dander, uh, but that's when they get a little bit older. So if you have little kids at home, little kids and chickens go together like peanut butter and jelly. They just do. But when they're little, when these are baby chicks are newly hatched, they're pretty delicate. And, you know, when you put something in a little kid's hand, the first thing they want to do is give it a squeeze. Well, when that chicken gets to be 10 days old, she can squeeze it a little bit. But when it's three days old, maybe not. So maybe refrain from letting the kids hold them too much until they get to be about two weeks old. Next slide, please. But, you know, kids and chickens, I mean, it's the fastest growing segment of 4-H. Uh, has been for decades. It, it's kind of the gateway livestock poultry is. So... You're going to need something. Now, whoever created this PowerPoint, she believed in going from like a small box to a medium box to a big box. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But you're really going to be needing to keep them uh, enclosed for six weeks. That's about how long it takes for them to get their feathers and be ready to move outside. At our house, we use a big box and they just stay in that same big box until they're uh, about six weeks old. So food, water. Um, I will tell you... Um, a trick that we've learned many years ago. My wife broods a lot of chicks every year. She hardly ever loses any. And I, I'm convinced one of the secrets is, and I'm not going to keep it a secret, uh, you give them bottled water. Believe it or not, that really seems to help. Now, you, you're probably going, I am not going to give bottled water to my chickens their whole life. I don't expect you to, just the first week or so. When they're newly hatched, they're pretty delicate. What's coming out of your tap water, you don't know how much chlorine's in there. There's a lot of variables. You don't know what's coming out of your well water exactly a lot of times. So take that variable out of the equation. Just give them purified drinking water. Doesn't have to be fancy, you know, nothing distilled either. That's not real good. But purified drinking water for the first week, vitamins and electrolytes, and off you go. And you keep their feeders full. Just free feed them. Next slide. They self-regulate uh, very, very well. Uh, they eat what they need and they stop when they, they get full, basically, or they reach their nutritional requirements. So we talked about, you know, something to keep them in. Next slide, please. 
So I like to set them up ahead of time. That way you're ready to go. You're not making, you know, half a dozen trips back and forth to the farm store. Get your heat lamps up and running, maybe a day in advance. Make sure they're working. They're not going to burn out on you, especially if you've used them the, the season before. Um, again, the second lamp in case uh, one of them burns out. You don't really need a thermometer. If you want to get one, fine. Uh, 90 to 95 is your ideal temperature, but the baby chicks are going to tell you they get too hot. They get underneath. the. If they get too hot, they move away from the lamp. They get too cold. They huddle under it. Next slide, please. So these graphics, the little yellow dots, those are your baby chicks. Uh, it's pretty basic. I, I will tell you that do not set them up in a draft. You don't want to set your brooder tank up like right where you open the door and they get a draft on them. I don't know the mechanics, <clears throat> but it does something with your immune system and you'll start losing chicks. That's why your, your farm stores always have them set up at the back of the store you know, it's not because it's like a casino and they want you to walk there and see everything. It has to, everything to do with they don't want them in a draft. So next slide, please. So we talked about the water. Um, I like to use the quart size, the small quart size waters, depending on how many chicks you're starting off with. I doubt most of you will be starting off with 25 or more. So the quart size, it's, they're smaller, they don't take up as much space. Now you're gonna to need to graduate when they get bigger, <clears throat> when, especially when they move outside, you'll go to a gallon size or maybe even bigger, maybe a five gallon size, just depends on your setup. So the vitamins and the electrolytes they have, um, you add that to the water for about the first three to five days. That definitely reduces the stress on the birds and it helps reduce your losses. That with the bottled water really seems to help. Now, if you're getting your chicks from the mill, they will get these chicks started from you. They get them in from the postal system, from the hatchery, and they get them started. They dip their beaks in water, they get them drinking. Uh, they kind of take to that pretty naturally. But you really want to hydrate them for about the first six hours before you feed them. Baby chicks are really kind of amazing. You know, they can go clear across country without food and water. And the way they do that is they are living on the yolk. And so the cool thing is they can go clear across country for three days. The not so cool thing is if you feed them right away, it tends to create very, very sticky feces. And it ends up creating a shell around their vent and it's the name. And yes, this is actually the name. They call it pasty butt. Uh, if you don't correct it, those chicks can die. So if you hydrate them before you feed them for about six hours, it reduces this tremendously. If you see a chick with pasty butt, don't just peel that off. You have to correct it, but don't do that. You might tear the vent. They could bleed out. It, it can stress the bird real bad. The best way to do it is take a paper towel, wet it with warm water, hold it on that little clump of cement, basically. It, it, it gets hard like cement. Hold it on there for about five minutes. It will dissolve and you can wipe it right off. If this continues, and generally it doesn't, but if it does, you can put a little dab of Vaseline around the bird's vent and then it won't get it again. So, Next slide. Please. Twain, I got a couple questions that okay. pertain to this one kind of. Um, one is about what kind of bedding do you like to use for your chicks and that's heat lamp safe. And then the second is what kind of electrolytes are you usually using for your birds? Well, you would absolutely have to use a poultry specific vitamin electrolyte um, not just like Gatorade or something. It has to be poultry specific. They will have that there at the mill. Um, there are several brands, but as long as they're poultry specific, they're fine and they're not expensive and they've got a good shelf life. And, and, you know, they even have some that come in single packets. Uh, they make a gallon. It's real easy. So it just depends on, uh, which brand you want to go with, but they all work pretty well. The shavings, I, I like pine shavings. Um, the good news is those are the inexpensive ones that you use for horses. Uh, they're inner. You don't want to use redwood or cedar shavings because there is a toxin in that oil. That's why it keeps bugs out of them. But you don't want your chicks breathing that. You don't want them getting it in their eyes. And you don't really want to use sawdust if you can help it because of the respiratory issues. So pine shavings, again, it's cool because they're the cheap ones. So hopefully I answered the questions there. Yep. Thank you, Twain. Mm -hmm. We're good to move on. All right, so keep the feeders full. You will hear the term free feed. You'll hear that all the time in this hobby, and that's what they're talking about. So keep the feeders full. They will self-regulate. 
The one exception are your Cornish cross meat birds. Um, I think we have a section a little later that we talk about them, so I won't delve too deep into that. It didn't seem like we had a ton of interest on these anyway. Um, but everything else, your Bantams, your Fancies, your, your laying hens, most of you will probably be doing laying hens. You free feed them, and you're going to give them a baby chick starter feed for the first 16 weeks. Now, I know it says six weeks on this. The six, first six weeks is really, really critical. But really, you want to feed them a good quality chick starter the first 16 weeks because that's they're going to be on chick starter the whole time. You're setting the stage for this chicken's entire life. Um, if we were talking about horses, you know, if you had a racehorse, you're going to feed it really good as a foal. Uh, and you're setting the stage for that that little guy's whole life. Same thing with these these ladies, these chickens. You're setting the stage for their whole life. Next slide, please. Can you hang on? I'm, I'm going to step away for just one. Yep, we got a couple men menti questions here. Again, go to menti.com and use the code 6091110, and we're going to ask you a couple questions. Question one, so I got to get quick on it. How many chickens should you get? How many chicks should you get? So you got two options here. One, chicks like to be alone, or at least two. Answer quick. Yeah, can I elaborate on that just a little bit? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you definitely never want to get one chicken. Chickens are flock animals. They get very neurotic by themselves. They don't do well. They actually, um, they don't lay very well and their health isn't real good. They, they need other chickens. Uh, two is a pretty good number. I mean, it's it's it fits the bill, but just the minimum. And I don't like you to get started with two because something can happen to one and you're down to that lonely number. A good rule uh, of thumb is four to six is a good starting number for baby chicks. But you also need to know what your ordinances are uh, in your area. I don't want to say, yeah, go get six chickens and you can only have four in your area, that type of thing. So, But one is not a good idea. Next question, two of seven. Do you need a rooster to get eggs? Again, menti.com, use code 6091110. Do you need a rooster to get eggs? You need a rooster to get baby chicks. This is still my most common question. So we like to throw it in here because uh, it is so common and people may be embarrassed to ask about it. And some people don't even get chickens. They're like, you know, the ordinance makes no sense. They say I can have six chickens, but I can't have a rooster. So what's the point? Well, you can get six chickens and get plenty of eggs and you don't need the rooster. So, but if you want baby chicks, you need that rooster. Okay, so just a little bit about our timeline, um, what to expect. So, you bring the little fluff balls home, you're free feeding them the baby chick starter feed, you've got them under a heat lamp or you've got um, maybe a radiant heater, either one, however you want to do it. Um, that's kind of becoming the latest thing. I don't know if we have a slide for that now. But anyway, uh, so about the first six weeks, you're going to be brooding these baby chicks. So I tell people, don't go by the calendar, go by the chicken. I don't care if they're six or seven weeks old, if they're still downy and they've got down on them, it's not time to go outside yet. And this does vary a little bit by breed. So you want them to be fully feathered. Um, they talk about moving them to a bigger cardboard box um, inside the coop. That's really not, I'm not too thrilled with that. But uh, if it's your first time, you don't need the cardboard box to put them in the coop. And, you know, you don't have any other chickens in there. They can go right from the brooder right into the coop. Now, if you have existing chickens in there, that's a whole nother story. Uh, Nathan, do we have a slide about integrating chickens or do I need to delve into that now? Uh, you can kind of delve into it now. All right, so common mistake people make, why don't you go back a, a slide? Common mistake people make is they bring home the baby chicks and they, uh, 
think that somebody in the coop's going to magically kind of be like a Disney movie and get a maternal instinct. And they throw those poor little baby chicks in there. And please, please, please trust me on this. Do not do this. Nobody will uh, develop a maternal instinct. In fact, if you have little kids, you can't unsee this. All right. They will probably eat them. Uh, if those chicks do not belong to them, they are on the menu. Uh, they can be kind of brutal. Okay. So don't do that. But <clears throat> you can bring the chicks home, brood them for six weeks, and then move the juveniles out into the coop. Now, here's an another common mistake people make is they brood them. And then at six weeks, oh, well, that idiot from Neutrina said they're ready to go outside. So they just throw them outside. So now I'm being very clear about this. They need to go in the coop. You can't just put them outside. If you put them outside, they don't know where home is. They've been indoors. They've been in the garage or the house. They have no idea where home is. So don't do that, okay? They'll wander off. Something will pick them off. They'll sleep up in the trees. Who knows? But they're not going to stay home. So they need to go in the coop. So I'm also kind of telling you six weeks from the time you bring these little fluff balls home, you're going to need a coop to put them in. So keep that in mind. Um, so if you're going to integrate juvenile chicks in with your adults, you can just put them in there, but it's going to be a whole drama fest. Uh, if you already have chickens, you already realize that your chicken coop is kind of like uh, a middle school classroom full of girls. And it's all about drama. Chickens are all about drama. Uh, so you can't really, I'm going to say you, you can, but you really shouldn't just add your juveniles in there. The best way is to introduce them somewhat slowly. Uh, the best way I have found is a wire cage, like a dog crate. Put the juveniles in there for about two weeks. Feed them and water them in the coop. So they're in there with the adult chickens, but the big girls can't get to them. All right. And then one evening, take your young girls and put them up on the perches next to the old ones and let them all wake up together. Chickens are virtually blind at night. They can't see at night. So if you do this at night, put them up on the perches. No, they're not going to be a big happy family, but you have taken steps to reduce the drama. Uh, I also like to put something special, you know, some scratch or something down that night. So in the morning, the first thing the girls see is that special treat and it kind of distracts them a little bit from the new new chickens. You don't want to do that all the time. You don't want to leave food on the ground at night because you'll get rodents. But one night's not going to hurt anything. So once you get them in there and integrated, make sure you have extra food and water stations. This is very, very important. Uh, you'll hear the term pecking order. Um, chickens are flock animals. It's all about dominance. You have alpha and omega, you know, top and bottom and everything in between. Uh, and sometimes the top chickens don't let the bottom chickens drink and eat. So you want to add water stations. This especially is important in the summertime. Your babies are still going to be on the baby chick food for the first 16 weeks. Your adults are on adult food. They're going to mix a little bit back and forth. Mostly the adults will be eating the baby food. It's a dominance. It's a form of dominance. But as long as you have oyster shell out there, free choice for them, that should be fine. Uh, because that is really the biggest difference between your baby food and the adult food is the protein level and the calcium level. There's a few other things too, but you need that calcium for them to lay eggs. So have oyster shell available. At 16 weeks, you're going to move them over to a layer feed, and that's what they're going to be on for the rest of their life. Uh, I, I hate that, that they say, oh, 16 to 24 weeks, you can expect eggs. Yeah, maybe a chicken somewhere, somewhere in the, in the world laid an egg at 16 weeks. That's not real common at all. It's going to be more like 20 to 24 weeks. You'll start getting eggs, maybe 26, eight weeks, depending on the breed. Uh, but you need to pump up the calcium in her system before she lays that first egg. Otherwise, uh, they'll have a calcium deficiency and they start laying and they develop a very nasty habit of eating eggs. It's very hard to break and we don't want to go through that. So next slide now. Yeah, while you're on that, can you just touch on why you'd, you would rather feed oyster shells instead of crushed eggshells? Yeah, um, I mean, okay, if we were in a zombie apocalypse and you couldn't get oyster shells, sure, you could feed them back the crushed eggshells. The problem is your particle size. If the particle size is too big, eh, you could, in theory, teach those girls to eat their own eggs. Here's the, the solution most people do is they go, oh, well, I'll just grind it up real fine. Well, it passes right through the chicken then. If the particle size isn't big enough, uh, they're not absorbing the calcium properly. And it just doesn't work nearly as well as oyster shell. Um, and oyster shell is real cheap. So it's not like I'm trying to sell you something that's real expensive. 
uh, and they don't even go through that much. So in theory, the layer feed has enough calcium for them, but chickens are individual, so they all have a little bit different needs. This is to supplement in case they need it. They self-regulate. Chickens are really cool about that. If they need calcium, they'll get it. If they don't need it, they'll leave that alone. So hope that kind of cleared that up a little bit. Next slide. Okay, this is going to be up until this point, you are, aren't going to have spent very much money. You're thinking, oh, this is a real cheap hobby. It is not a real expensive hobby any way you cut it, but here's going to be your biggest outlay of money. Right here is your coop. Now you can build your own. You can repurpose something. There's kits available. It's kind of the sky's the limit. I'm going to give you some tips um, so you don't make some of the same mistakes I've made. First and foremost, make sure that coop is predator proof. One of the biggest misnomers in this hobby is a thing called chicken wire. Chicken wire keeps chickens in, but it does not keep predators out. Raccoons being uh, public enemy number one, and I joke that they can put their nasty little jazz hands right through chicken wire, grab your chickens by the neck, and they try to pull them through. They get frustrated, and then they kill all the witnesses. So one bad night, you can lose your whole flock of chickens. So you want to use a product called hardware cloth. Yes, it's more expensive, but they're little squares and the raccoons can't put their nasty little hands through it. Another tip, mistake I made, you take a staple gun and put that on there, that hardware cloth, the raccoon, get up there, can peel that open. So you want to make sure that is nailed down with like those little U-shaped nails. I don't know what they call those, but... A uh, stapler raccoons can apparently uh, peel that open. So you want to make sure you secure it that way. Your latches on the door and even that flap, and that, that's a good design that we're looking at in that coop. That flap in the front is where your egg laying nests are. So you can get the eggs from the outside. But even that flap, I would put either a padlock on it or a some kind of a pretty complicated uh, latch or, or uh, clip on there because raccoons can open a simple clip. They're really clever. They take night classes for that. So make sure you have that secured because just one time they get in there and you can lose all your birds. So that being said, in your design, if you can design your, your coop to where you can get the eggs from the outside, this makes your life a whole lot easier, especially if you live in the Midwest or the Northeast where we have snow and ice. Another tip I'll give you is I'm old and fat, and I don't like climbing on my hands and knees to pick up eggs. I'm sure you won't either, especially in the ice and snow. Uh, so design your coop where you can walk inside of it. This makes life a lot easier. Now, if you have the flap on the outside, that's half the battle. But, you know, having a coop you can walk into, if you ever have to go in and, and do any maintenance on, on your birds or anything, it makes life so much easier. You should handle your chickens several times a year minimum just to check their body condition make sure they're not real skinny make sure they don't have uh, external parasites that kind of thing and having it where you can walk inside makes life so much easier so you're going to find that your chickens do way way better with cold than they do heat so keep that in mind uh, i talked a little bit before but i think there's a lot of people on now that weren't on you really don't need to heat your coop Chickens do very, very well in the cold. Um, I'm in southern Wisconsin. Uh, we just were at like 18 below. We were 45 below a couple of years ago. Uh, we don't heat the coop. We do not insulate the coop. It's not insulated. And we did not lose a single chicken. So you might be looking out your window and thinking, oh my God, if my dog was out there, he'd be cold. Yeah, he would be, but he's a mammal. They metabolize cold very, very differently than a chicken does. If a chicken is kept dry, that's the key. If they're kept dry, they do just great. Make sure you don't have anything metal in that coop for them to roost on, or they can get frostbite on their toes, okay? But make sure, I, I'm not going to say make sure, I'm just not a fan of heat in the coop because if there's a fire hazard associated with it. Usually it's that heat lamps hanging there, and one of these big girls decides she's going to sleep on that, and she gets up on there, and she may get away with it for weeks, but eventually... Whatever's holding it up comes loose, and that gets down on your shavings, and off you go. Uh, and if that coop um, is anywhere near your house, that can really be a big issue. Did you have a question? Yes, I did. Uh, somebody was asking about rounded versus flat roost. Uh, what do you recommend for that? 
Or uh, what's your personal preference, I guess? Round is old school. Uh, the, the, they say the square ones are better for cold because the way the bird sets, they cover their, their knuckles better. Um, we actually have square ones at our house, and we live in the cold. So that's that was what I was told. The thought process behind those two are uh, is the they keep their feet warmer by the way they sleep on them on a, on a square one. So. Hopefully that answered the question. I think round works pretty well too. They, and it's it's amazing. You know, you'll see them walking around in the in the icy water and the snow and stuff, and it doesn't seem to bother their feet too much. But I will tell you, if they sleep on something metal and it gets cold out there, you know that sub zero weather, they can lose their toes. So you don't want to have that happen. Now they always ask talk about the ventilation. The reason why you want it well ventilated is one the summertime. That's obvious, but in the winter time. If that thing is too buttoned up and all these birds are in there breathing, respirating, they're putting moisture in the air and that can cause frostbite. So having a vent up in the corner somewhere so that moisture can go out, but you don't want that vent right where they're sleeping. So that hence the well ventilated, but not drafty. They always say that, but nobody explains it. So I'm trying to explain it here. So you want to have a vent to let that moisture out, but just not where they're sleeping because they will end up moving or they won't be comfortable and they get stressed. Um, you'll hear stress that term a lot in this hobby. Anytime something goes wrong with the chicken, they get stressed. Unfortunately, uh, nothing good comes from stress. Typically, they stop laying is the first thing that happens. So um, I guess next slide. All right, so I'm going to run through the breeds uh, relatively quickly. Uh, I'm very opinionated on, on, on the breeds. Uh, there's no such thing as a bad chicken. There are just some that are better beginner chickens than others. And this is really kind of at the very beginning of your thought process of getting chickens is what do you want the birds to do? Do you want them to be egg layers? Do you want them to be meat chickens? Do you want them to be pets? What do you want out of these birds? I will tell you, layers are the most common, and they do make good pets. Uh, then meat chickens, I, I kind of feel you need to be a little bit more advanced, maybe a year in. Uh, not absolutely. Um, they're a little more delicate than your laying hens or your fancies. Now, your fancies would be like your bantams, the miniatures, the ones that are not really utilitarian they don't produce a lot of eggs and stuff they tend to sometimes be smaller birds uh even if they're not a bantam they tend to be a smaller bodied bird may not be as cold hardy um they they make they're a lot of fun for kids to show but they don't produce like your laying hens so next slide please got another minty question here what is America's favorite backyard chicken? Again, if you go to menti.com, type in the code 6091110, and you can be able to answer the questions. I don't think we we'll talked. We'll be giving out some prizes at the end. <laughs> this is going to be on their own research, I guess, huh? <laughs> we'll hope it's accurate. <laughs> this may start an argument, too. It depends on what comes up. Answer quick. Correct answer is Rhode Island Red. That was the correct answer for many, many, many decades, and 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 it may still be. It, it nobody's done a study for sure. I think the Orpingtons maybe maybe passing them. They're really really popular. But the Rhode Island Red for many many years was America's favorite backyard chicken. Uh, they are the state bird of Rhode Island. They are awesome. They're all the right traits. They're smart. They're good foragers. They're not broody. When we talk about broody, that means they want to be mom. That's not a good trait for most of you, meaning they are not going to try and hatch their eggs. I'm not going to say it never happens, but it's not real common. About 250 big brown eggs a year. They're cold hardy, heat tolerant. I mean, they're, they're just a great beginner's choice. So. Orpingtons, uh, golden retriever of the chicken world. I mean, they are really catching up. They're real popular. The most common is the buff. 
they come in many colors, but buff is the most common. Super, super sweet chickens with hardly any work at all. They're great with kids. There is a little bit of a downside. They're not super predator safe. You know, hi, Mr. Coyote. I'm Mabel. How are you? They're not too predator safe. They can be a little bit more broody than a roadie, uh, but not too bad. Um, really a great choice. They're not quite as good a layer. Big, big brown egg, about 200 a year, uh, but a great choice for a beginner. This is another one, another great beginner's chicken, the Plymouth Bard Rocks. Another, the, all of these are cold hardy, heat tolerant. She's not broody, she's smart. Uh, good, good free range bird, uh, just a great beginner's chicken. And not necessarily just beginner's chickens. I have, I have Buff Orpingtons, I have Rhode Island Reds. I don't have any Bardies right now, but uh, I do in the past. They're, they're just great birds. All of these are what I call quarter vanilla ice cream chickens. Uh, everybody's got them, and for good reason. They're great chickens. You, you'll be happy with all of these. About 250 big brown eggs a year on this one, too. This is another good beginner's chicken. They're from Australia, um, but believe it or not, they're very cold hardy. Um, big brown eggs, about 225 a year. Uh, you may read a tidbit about her, you know, you catch all these little uh, trivia things. Uh, they did a contest which chicken laid the most consecutive days and, and Black Oster or won. And I'm telling you this because you might get the misconception she's the best layer. She's not. She's a good layer, but she's not the best one. That was kind of a fluke. But a good beginner's chicken. Also, uh, they say if you have black chickens in your flock, at least a couple of them, it helps uh, keep the hawks away. I don't know if this is true. I, I've heard this from since I was a kid because hawks and crows hate each other. And from a distance, black chickens look like crows. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. Wyandots, uh, uh, very, very beautiful chickens. That's a silver laced, about 200 big brown eggs a year. All the right traits, cold hardy, heat tolerant. Very, very pretty. This is the most common. The gold lace is the next most common. Uh, just another great beginner's chicken. By the way, you can mix all these if you get them at the same age. They grow up like sisters. And in fact, I recommend you get a variety and then you can see which ones you like yourself. Next slide. What eggs do you like to eat, Twain? What color are you shooting for? <laughs> Most of my chickens are brown egg layers. Uh, although are my, they? Yeah, yeah. That we have mostly brown egg layers. And that has to do with temperament, typically. Hey, everybody got that right. All right, I'm going to elaborate just a touch here just to confuse the heck out of everybody. You will see Easter Egger, Aracana, and Americana and you'll see those terms thrown around interchangeably. You'll even see it in the hatchery catalogs interchangeably. They're not, those are three different chickens. The Aracana was the root, they came from South America. If you don't show chickens, you've probably never seen one. They don't have a tail. They call them a rumpless breed. They lay uh, the colored eggs, but they didn't lay a lot of them. They weren't super friendly birds, uh, very broody. So somebody improved upon them and they crossed them and they created the Americana and those were recognized in the 80s and they only lay blue eggs. Now the Americana and the Aracana both breed true, meaning if you cross two Aracanas, you get another Aracana out. You cross two Americanas, you get another Americana out. The hatcheries got involved and created the Easter Egger. Think of an Americana without a pedigree. If you cross two Easter eggers, you'll get another chicken out, but it won't be another Easter egger. It's going to be something else. They all, the hatcheries kind of have their own little different uh, genetics. They're not bad chickens, guys. They lay green eggs typically, all the right traits. You just can't show them as a purebred. People try to show them as Americanas once in a while, and they will lecture you vigorously. And they're just not a purebred. There's nothing wrong with them, though. But if you're buying from a farm store, I don't care what the, the catalog says or the, the poster or whatever, it, it's going to be an Easter egger. And I don't mean 
to uh, throw the, the stores under the bus because the hatcheries do this. So um, I still see that in hatchery catalogs. And I asked one of the owners one time and he said, that's oh, just easier. We don't want to go through the ex explanation. And I said, wow, it took me almost a minute to explain that. But OK, so now, you know, there are three different chickens and what you're getting are Easter eggers. Next, next slide, please. There they are. They're great chickens. Uh, all the right, all the right traits. About 200 green eggs. Typically green. They can lay pink or, or blue, but that's not typically the case. But it can happen. Uh, they're friendly, smart, uh, cold hardy. They're not quite as big as some of the other birds we've we've covered so far, but definitely a good beginner's chicken. All right. So you may see this in the farm store. You may see that on the tank, a sex link. And it's like, oh my God, I have kids. What are you doing? It has nothing to do with that. They're a crossbreed. Uh, there's nothing wrong with these. These are great birds. And they call them a sex link because by crossing them, they can tell at a glance by the color if they're male or female. So it eliminates the need for sexing those chicks at the hatchery. You know, they have to pay somebody to do that. It's expensive. They run about 95% accurate, which is pretty impressive, but in a box of 105 of you won't be happy. So on sex links, you're getting closer to 100%. Um, and you have what we call hybrid vigor, um, meaning they, you know, when you have hybrids, they have a great immune system. They're smart. And these guys that are guys, these gals, sex links, you're up around 300 eggs a year typically. They're really good producers, really good temperament. I'm a big fan of sex links. The only downside to them is they say uh, most shows won't let you show them. So if you're not showing chickens, who cares? Um, also, you may read because they were genetically um, bred for egg production, they are a little bit more prone to um, things like uh, ovarian cancer, things like that. So in a large, like if we were insurance agents and we were doing like a large number, you know, percentage wise, these might not live quite as long as your, your heritage breeds. But other than that, I've not really seen that much difference in them. Uh, they're a really great beginner's chicken. Next slide. Please. Well, will you see much variation in their, their egg color. You know, if one's laying green eggs throughout its whole life, I mean, will they always lay green eggs or will they lay some blue eggs too? We're talking about the Easter eggers? Yeah, on the, yeah. On the Easter eggers, they lay one color. So if they're a green egg layer, um, she's going to lay a green egg layer. Now that's not to say that as she gets older, that may wash out a little bit, and the color may may lighten a little bit. But if she's a green egg layer, she's going to lay green eggs her whole life. If she's a pink egg layer, and the pink's kind of a rip off, it, it's almost like a brown egg, <laughs> but they call it pink. Uh, and blue on the Americanas, it's very blue. On the Easter eggers, it's kind of a like a bird egg blue. Um, but that's what they will lay their whole life. They don't switch it up. That goes Perfect. for all the Thank you, Twain. brown egg layer. They're going to lay brown eggs their whole life. So next slide. All right. So we talked about this. We, I think we've already talked about integrating, uh, the juveniles into the flock. So I got ahead of myself, uh, and I apologize for that, but we've already covered that. So next slide. Yeah, I think the next couple will be talking about it, but I'll yeah, um, you want them to be fully feathered, and we talked about you know, um, and then at about six weeks, six to eight weeks, your chicks can start with your uh, your treats and grit and things like that. And there, there is some people that like to give them chick grit, but you know, technically they don't really need that if they're on a water soluble crumble. They don't really need grit. Uh, until they start eating. Grit is how chickens digest their food, by the way. Uh, you ever wondered how a chicken can eat a whole dry kernel of corn and they don't have any teeth? As a chicken cruises around, they pick up little rocks and they hold them in a muscle called the gizzard and they have their own little grinding mill. But if a bird is only eating crumbles or pellets, water soluble, they technically don't need grit. So commercial birds never get grit. But your, your chickens, you should have it available for them because when it's muddy or snowy, they may not be able to find the little rocks. So they can have all kinds of cop, crop complications if they're eating grain and they don't have grit available. So next slide, please. 
Yeah, keep going with these. I'm sorry, I, I've already covered that. Um, all right, ducklings. So, a couple of things. Next slide. Uh, ducks, please never try to brood baby ducks and anything else together. Waterfowl with waterfowl, don't try to mix in any kind of turkeys or chickens or anything like that. The waterfowl will get your baby chicks wet, they get chilled, they die. It's, it's pretty simple, so don't do that. Uh, a life-changing thing I found a couple of years ago was somebody said, hey, if you put a couple of uh, dog pee pee pads down underneath your shavings, uh, it really reduces the mess. And I got to tell you, it does. It helps tremendously. So keep that in mind. Uh, other than that, they brood about the same way. You know, the, the lamp or the radiant heater, uh, free feed them. Uh, they self-regulate just like your laying hens do. Uh, they're going to be a little messy. Uh, the, the misconception is that they're playing in the water. They actually have to keep their mucous membranes wet pretty much all the time. And so they're always have their face in the water. So um, just keep that in mind. They are a little messier. You will definitely need to clean them every day, even if you have the PP pads. Next slide. They grow crazy fast. Never feed them medicated feed. Um, that is a big no-no. Uh, it's not approved for baby ducks and can cause, cause them harm. So you don't want to do that. Uh, just like your baby chicks, I, I'm a big fan of doing the, the bottled water for the first week, vitamins and electrolytes. Uh, and the same thing, you want to uh, uh, hydrate them before you feed them, just like your baby chicks. Next slide, please. So the reason why they don't want you to mix species is a couple of things. The main thing is biosecurity. Uh, when you start mixing species, you can start running into disease issues. Uh, ducks are really, really tough. They have great immune systems. They don't ever really seem to get sick, but they do live in kind of a wet, moist environment, and it can make everything around them sick. So cooping ducks with other species can be very challenging. Uh, you're probably better off not to. Um, you also have to watch out. Uh, with your male ducks, they can be really, really hard on your chickens. And I know we probably have some kids on here, so I'm going to keep this very G-rated. But yeah, you want to just watch that. The male ducks can be hard on your hens. Um, so I'm not saying you can't mix species. People do it all the time. Uh, you just have to you know, take special considerations. The ideal situation is where they're actually kind of separate, where they don't actually mix with each other. That is probably your best bet. Next slide. So ducks have different nutritional requirements than chickens. So you ideally want to feed them a duck specific feed. They need higher niacin, lower calcium, uh, ideally about an 18% protein. Although uh, at certain times of the year, you want that lower where they can get a problem, uh, a condition called angel wing. So, but really you, if possible, a duck specific feed, they just tend to do better with that. Next, next slide, please. There's your angel wing. Uh, it's from growing too fast and the wing tips twist. It's very, very hard to correct. It's not just from the feed. I've been told that can be a, a genetic issue as well, but the feed contributes to it, having too high a protein. Um, so we developed a duck specific feed uh, specifically to try to avoid these type of problems. Um, and we, we interviewed several nationally known duck breeders and we kind of hit all the right bullet points the pre and probiotics uh, the lower calcium higher niacin and lower mycotoxin levels next slide please and there it is so it is designed from the ground up to be a duck feed it's not a an all flock type situation or a layer feed in a different bag it is a duck feed your your male ducks don't need very much calcium at all so if you are feeding them like a chicken layer feed you can actually uh, do them great harm to their kidneys. So they have short little pellets, which uh, make them, they're hard, so they hold up in the water. And, you know, all, all ducks in theory can eat them because they're a small pellet. So even your call ducks, your small ducks can eat them. So next slide, please. So your man, we, we talked about that, your biosecurity issues, uh, challenges with that. Um, your ducks are pretty active at night. 
I'm just going to tell you, they can be a little noisy. And, you know, with the rooster, that's who gets you in trouble. It's the male. But with your ducks, it's the girls that are loud mouths. Uh, they can be blabber mouths at night. Um, just throwing that out there. Ducks are a ton of fun. They have a lot of personality. Um, if you ever handle your ducks, you don't ha ever handle ducks by the feet. Their feet are very, very delicate. You handle them by the wings uh, without having a duck here to show you. But if I'm sure if you went on YouTube, there would be somebody that shows you how to handle ducks. Uh, chickens, you can handle however and including the feet, but uh, ducks you never handle by the feet. Next slide, please. Looks like we got another Menti question here. What is the only continent without chickens? We'll see how cold hardy they really are, Twain. <laughs> you know, that's not the main reason why there's no chickens up there, though. They, they were really afraid that... Uh, the chicken diseases would get up there and infect the uh, penguins, and they did. Uh, whether there's chickens there or not, they somehow got up there. So, who was the original crazy chicken lady? She's not here tonight either. <laughs> You think there's a true right or wrong answer here? <laughs> I don't well, see Twain yeah, Lockhart on there. <laughs> no, no, I'm not the chicken lady. Uh, chicken guy, maybe. Uh, anybody know what kind of chickens Queen, Queen Victoria had? Buff Orpingtons, what'd she have? Uh, Cochins. Dang it. They came from China. A ship's captain gave them to her, and she fell in love with them. Now, here's a good question. What is the estimated number of chickens in the world? Ten. What's the most number of chickens you've ever had, Twain? We, at our height of our chicken ownership, we had about 300. We were showing chickens at the time. <laughs> Twenty-four billion. It's about three to one. There's about three chickens to every man, woman, and child somewhere in that neighborhood. So we better be nice to them. I didn't know Beyonce had chickens. <laughs> Well, there you go. There's your winner of your mentee leaderboard. The vote goat. So does anybody have any questions? I'll do my best to answer. I know, Twain. We talked a little bit about... Uh, putting chickens and ducks together, but what about turkeys? What about like brooding turkeys and uh, chickens together or just housing them together? All right, so I, I've got to give you my, my typical disclaimer again, you're not supposed to mix species for biosecurity, blah, 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 blah. You're not supposed to do that, okay? Uh, chickens and turkeys is, are kind of a big no-no because chickens can carry a thing called blackhead that can kill your turkeys. I will tell you though, in 50 years of raising poultry, uh, I have only ever seen it in a book, okay? It's out there. And if you were raising turkeys commercially, you would not want a chicken on your zip code, okay? Because of that, the chances. It could put you out of business, uh, put you into bankruptcy. You have two, two turkeys on the farm with your chickens. If they should get sick and die, it's probably not going to spin you into bankruptcy, okay? So where I'm saying with this is technically you're not supposed to mix them, but everybody does, all right? So, in fact, brooding, 
Rooting baby turkeys, especially the meat varieties, the broad-breasted whites and bronzes, can be a little bit more challenging than baby chicks. Uh, they're not as intelligent as baby chickens, and they we kind of take for granted that, well, they kind of look like a funny-looking chicken, so they're going to act like a chicken. They don't. Uh, baby chickens pretty much come stock from the factory. They know how to eat. Turkeys, not so much. Um, you kind of have to help them a little bit. And one of the old farmer tricks was you would just stick a baby chicken in there with the turkeys to teach them all how to eat. Now, don't leave them in there too long because uh, what happens is that baby chicken will dominate all those turkey poults. And after a couple of weeks, those turkeys are going to be three times as big and they're going to get tired of that chicken telling it what to do and they'll do that chicken in. Also, if you leave that chicken in there too long, that chicken will be real weird. Uh, I, I jokingly say, because they, they only know how to speak turkey, they can't speak chicken. The other chickens won't accept them after that. But a couple of days, they typically will teach the turkey poults how to eat. But again, technically, you're not really supposed to do that. You're supposed to put something real shiny in their food, marbles. There's a product called Grow Gel. I don't have any vested interest in it. I've only ever seen it on the internet. And it looks like neon colored uh, jello. And you put that in the food and that gets your game birds to eating. One last thing while we're on turkeys is the first couple of days, cover the bedding with paper towels because they'll eat their bedding. Uh, they're really bad about filling up on, on the shavings and there's no nutrition. So they'll starve to death with the full crop. But there's no food in their crop. It's all shavings. But after the first three days or so, they, they kind of get the hang of it. So so we have a couple more questions in here, Twain. Um, okay. Are there any alternatives to pine shavings in the brooder? Um, I, the people, some of people are using, there's some of the pelleted beddings that they've used. Uh, just be careful on, on those pelleted beddings that they're, Chickens aren't too bad, but uh, you get into turkeys and maybe your meat chickens, if they can swallow them, they might. I don't think they're they're toxic, but uh, there's no nutrition in them, and they fill up on something with zero nutrition, and they end up starving to death, you know, with a dish full of food. So people use those. I've heard people use pine, pine needles, mm, straw, eh. uh, anything that can poke a baby chick's eye out, I'm not too crazy about. Um, I'm not crazy about straw just because my experience in the past was it tended to mat mold. Um, I, I know there's some paper type bedding that they use for small animals. It seems to be okay. You got to watch them though. You don't want to get anything in there that they'll eat. If they start eating that stuff, I would go back to the shavings. Uh, but again, your chickens aren't too bad about eating the bedding. It's some of your game birds. So, um, Any recommendations for coop kits? Ah, oh, God, there's so many. There are so many. I will tell you, um, you're, you might be better off to spend a little more money and look at the, try to look at one that's put together and see how heavy duty the lumber is. Uh, some of those come from overseas. The wood's real light. They work. I just don't know how long they'll last yet. Uh, and those are the ones that you're going to see that are real inexpensive. Um I think you're better off to spend more money and get one that's going to last longer. But, you know, hey, everybody's got their own budget. Um, I wish I had a name of one for sure, but there, there's just so many of them. Uh, but look at the weight of the, of the, if it's real super lightweight, I'd probably look at something else because that means it's probably a real lightweight lumber. What do they have um, at the mill? Do they have, do they have some at the mill? Yeah, I know they have access to some, so I would okay. I would just get a hold of some of the people there at the mill, and they, they can get you taken care of. Yeah, yeah. Um, is an olive egger the same thing as an Easter egger? No. Uh, I'm trying to remember what a, an olive egger is. It's a crossbreed. Uh, they lay a darker egg. Um, they're, they're a different-looking chicken. They don't have the muff under the chin like the Easter egger. Uh, but they're another crossbreed. Um, they're not a bad choice. They're not near as common as the Easter Eggers. I think we have an olive egger now, but I can't remember what you cross to get an olive egger. I got you. Um, I'll ask my wife. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Always entertaining. Blue egg layer crossed with the brown egg layer is what she said. So it's not even to get exact, olive. <laughs> yeah, it's not even a, an exact art there. So I'm sure every every uh, 
category is going to have their own version of it. That's why they all look a little different. But they're not bad chickens. Okay, I think we got a little good two-parter here. At what age can you tell a rooster is a chick or a chick is a rooster? And then what do you do if you have an aggressive rooster? Don't forget, we're recording here. So Yes, um, <laughs> so it depends. Some people have a better uh, eye. Um, I can tell at about three weeks. And, and so what you're looking for with these chicks, and this is by no means an exact art, the roosters will be a little bigger. Their feet will be a little bigger. If you listen, and I know this sounds really nutty, but if you listen really close, they have a deeper voice. Um, and this is not exact. As they get a little bit older, as they start to get to be about six weeks or so, if you look at their tails, you may start seeing some iridescent colors in the tail feathers. And the tail may start angling up instead of like the classic duck tail, like a, like a chicken has, a uh, hen has. And again, not real, you know, that's not uh, 100%. Um, at about four months, they'll start crowing and they sound like they're choking on something and you're going to fool yourself going oh uh, uh, you know it must have a little cold or something no that's a baby rooster trying to crow and they go through this nonsense for about a week and then they they learn how to crow and once they learn how they don't shut up as far as aggressive chickens aggressive roosters first off i will tell you name the breed i've seen a mean one name the breed and i've seen plenty of nice ones okay I personally prescribe to the theory that it is genetic. So if you have a mean rooster and you breed him, he will throw mean roosters. Okay. Uh, so what do you do? Well, first off, you need to be in charge. Uh, it's a dominance game. And that's why they tend to go after the little kids and they go after sometimes ladies uh, because they feel they can get away with it and they dominate and they're in charge. And that's how they're telling you. So you kind of have to uh, be in charge. By no means am I telling you to abuse this rooster, but you have to kind of be in charge. Grab him, pick him up. You know, don't take his crap. Now, when you pick him up, make sure you're holding his neck because he may try to bite you too. And just carry him around. Remember, when a predator kills a chicken, they pick him up off the ground. So by you picking him up and carrying him around, in theory, you're dominating him. Uh, beyond that, uh, I've heard a lot of other homebrew methods, you know, carry them around upside down by their feet and stuff. I don't know if I want to recommend doing that because we may be getting a little bit borderline animal abuse there. But uh, the idea is you're dominating this rooster. But in a lot of cases, guys, I'm just going to tell you, if they start that, just find him. And I would say the ideal situation is uh, uh, call him, you know, turn him into gumbo. Uh, because if you give him to someone else, you're kind of giving your problem to somebody else. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's hard to break them of that if you can at all. Um, sometimes you'll break them of it and you think you've got them fixed and then they become a backstabber. So, you know, you think they, they won't attack you from the front. It's just every time you turn around, they're going to nail you. Um, at our house, my wife just calls them out as she puts it. There's tons of nice roosters out there. Life is too short to deal with the mean one. So there's plenty of nice roosters available out there that need a home because they're crowing, not because they're mean. Uh, but if you have little kids, I'm not a big fan of having a rooster with little kids. I grew up in an era when my parents thought that was funny. Uh, and I got chased around by, by a rooster. And it's amazing that I still love chickens. Uh, but it does, it can traumatize a little kid. You know, you have an eight pound Rhode Island red rooster and a, and a three-year-old. That's not really that funny anymore. Um, so just saying, uh, my little commentary on that, I don't want you to abuse the animals, but by all means, keep your family safe first. That's the main thing. So you remember, you don't need the rooster to, uh, to get eggs. So. Got another couple good questions here. Okay. What type of feeders and waters do you recommend or like to use well while they're inside i like plastic and then when they move outside i usually go to galvanized the the main reason is uh excuse me plastic outside in the sun will get brittle and crack uh and they don't last very long so you want to use galvanized um if you ever use apple cider vinegar uh as a supplement you don't want to put that in a galvanized water tank though because it will rust it away 
Um, beyond that, on the feeders, I, one of the neat ones I've seen, I, I don't have any particular brands. There is a neat one called a grandpa's feeder that the chickens step on and then it opens a flap and then the wild birds can't get in it. But that's the only one. I don't even know if those are available outside of out online. Uh, I don't want to get into specific brands. I'm sure the mill has plenty of, of really nice feeders, uh, but typically you do galvanized outdoors. So, by the way, keep your feeder when you hang your galvanized feeder in the coat, put it on a clip. And that way at night, part of your chores is take that thing off the clip before you, you shut the chickens up at night and put it in a metal trash can, put a lid on it because the rodents will climb down whatever you've got that hanging by, the cable or the chain and get in your feed. If you take away the food source, you won't get rodents. Now, that being said, the rule of thumb is your chicken will eat about five pounds of food per month per chicken. So if you have 10 chickens, it's about a bag a month. If you're going through a lot more than that, you're probably feeding something else. So, um, What is the best material for a dust bath? Um, that can be any kind of loose soil. Uh, we, we've used potting soil. Uh, in fact, your neighbor's potting soil in their garden is a favorite. Uh, if your chickens are free ranging, just keep that in mind. And it's all relative to how uh, attached they are to the flowers or the garden. Um, I like to put a little wood dust, wood dust in there and maybe a little diatomaceous earth to help prevent the, the bugs. Uh, I don't like diatomaceous earth as a breakout to prevent, but as a preventative, I do like it. And wood ash works for that too. And just about 10% in their, their dust bath. By the way, that's like a real social thing. And it's it has to do with the pecking order and stuff. There's cool dust baths and then somewhat cool dust baths. And then some that are not, you know, the uncool chickens uh, have to deal with. So um, it's very much a social thing. Um, I think last one we got here. Are there any plants that we don't want to uh, chickens to peck at or that we don't want to plant along the coop or along the run? Um, anything that I, I'm trying to think, it's been a while since I've had this question. I'm trying to remember, uh, um, they say that rhubarb is, is bad. Here, here's the thing with chickens, a well-fed chicken for the most part will not eat something that's bad for them. And I don't think it's a smart thing. I think it's a taste thing and an instinct thing. I don't think it, any chicken that, that was so well fed would touch rhubarb. Um, tomatoes, you know, they'll eat the heck out of tomatoes, the fruit, but the plant itself is very toxic. They leave it alone. Um, they seem to know. I, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer on that one. I should, but I'm kind of drawing a blank tonight on on that. I know rhubarb is one of them, and they sh you shouldn't give them onions and uh, uh, avocado peels. Uh, potato peels, if they mold, are bad. So. Well, I think we'll give you a pass on this one. You get, you answered all the rest of them. But I think uh, if you want to back up a slide, we we are, I'm going to type in the chat here. If if you're on this list, just please um, email me who who you are on this list, and we'll make sure that you get you get the right prizes, and we'll get you awarded and be able to get you taken care of. But if you're on this list, please um, email me. I just put my contact in the chat, so just give me, send me an email, and we'll get your your prize taken care of. I know the mill has been a great, great partner of Neutrina and Cargill and all of us here, and we we greatly appreciate them having us. Um, and we're we're thankful for all you all to join. And we have a couple, we have two more uh, meetings coming up in a couple weeks, so be looking for those. And we're going to be talking about some different topics and. Um, just trying to help you all out anywhere we can. But if there's no other questions, I'm I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here. And uh, I want to thank.